Next, from Chicago, in an interview from October, Illinois Channel correspondent Jeff Berkowitz talks with University of Chicago Law School professor Jeffrey Stone about how the presidential election will impact the makeup of the U.S. Supreme Court. This runs about 30 minutes. Look at Ferris. Berkowitz is my name, and politics is our game. And look, we're going to be doing lots of politics, but a lot of public policy and law all mushed together today. Because we have as our guest, we're very fortunate to have as our guest, Professor Jeff Stone, the Edward H. Levy Distinguished Professor, University Professor in the Law School, something like that. He has, well, the short of what you should know here is we're taping this in the law school. We're taping it on October 12th, Yom Kippur. So this is my atonement. I have to kind of get through, a, you know, get through an interview with a former professor of mine who's like an expert on constitutional law, has spent almost a half century, right? Getting there. Getting there. And written a dozen books, maybe 50 scholarly articles, I don't know, 300 other numerous book reviews. So this man's life has been devoted, it would be fair to say, to understanding the U.S. Constitution and the constitutional doctrine. And specifically, in addition to that, going more and more detailed, the First Amendment. So your bag, your emphasis is the Constitution of the United States, that whole doctrine, and the First Amendment, civil liberties, national security. You seem to be particularly interested in this tension of First Amendment and what happens to it when there's a time of war going back two centuries to the current. Did I get all that right? Yeah, all that's right. Well okay. Done. You plead guilty. I plead guilty, and I'm glad I taught you well. <laughs> okay, thank you. So what we're going to do now is a quick lightning round, sort of a Rorschach test. And I'm going to say a few words, and the professor, Professor Stone's going to just react. We're going to do five or ten of these, seeing how I moved. And it'll give you a sense of, I hope, Professor Jeff Stone. Then we'll get into the meat of the show. The meat of the show... You know, there's a presidential election on November 8th. You may have heard Donald Trump, Hillary Clinton. A lot of people think it's really important for a lot of reasons, but especially because surely whoever is president will get to appoint one justice and maybe four. And these people can stay around for, what, 30 to 40 years? Mm -hmm. Let me just stop there. Professor Jeff Stone. Is this the most important thing about the presidential election, the appointment, whoever, whether it's Trump or Hillary who wins, Republican or Democrat, different philosophies, different doctrines, different approaches. Most important thing, that it'll either be Trump making the appointments to the court or it'll be Hillary. Given that it's Donald Trump and given what I think about Donald Trump, I would say it's not the most important thing. The most important thing is the future of the nation. And uh, I think the difference between Hillary Clinton and Donald Trump in that larger respect is so great that as important as the Supreme Court is, and it is important going forward, um, there are even larger issues than that between these two. We'll get to that. So let's just start right there. Give me your gut on Hillary Clinton. Ten seconds. What comes to mind when I say the name Hillary Clinton? Smart, experienced, thoughtful. She's made some mistakes because she's been in public life a long time. Um, but basically, I think a sound uh, person who will be a very, very uh, capable president. Donald Trump. Donald Trump. Um, bigot, um, intemperate, thoughtless, uninformed, dangerous. Free speech at the modern university campus. In peril. I think that there is a movement today um, that threatens the robustness of freedom of expression on university campuses, and it's something that needs to be strongly resisted. Judge Richard Posner. Brilliant. Um, a colleague, someone I've known for a long time. Uh, a, just, a judge who has, who has learned how to think about these problems that he faces in very different ways over the, the breadth of his career. Liberals. Um, liberals, my own view is liberals basically have uh, the right sense of values for a good society. They're interested in fairness, they're interested in equality, they're interested in justice. 
Barack Obama? Um, I've known Obama a long time. I hired him when I was dean of the law school. Um, he's been a he's a very thoughtful, a very uh, um, well informed person who's faced unprecedented obstruction. His legacy remains to be seen. Um, I think he would have accomplished a great deal of good for this country if it hadn't been for the obstructionism in Congress. Um, I think his legacy uh, re remains to be seen. The law. Uh, the law is central to a well-ordered society, um, fascinating, always challenging, um, and uh, love to teach it. Well, you know, legal realism or legal formalism, which also is the latter is referred to, I guess, as traditional analysis of law. What I was taught when I was here in law school, and let me make this a little longer because it's so important and others may not know. When I was taught eons ago in law school is that if you want to understand the law and you get an issue, you look at statutes, state or federal, you look at the Constitution, state or federal, you look at case law, common law, you figure out the facts, you apply all those laws or statutes or constitution to the facts and you find out the closest precedent and then you can sort of predict where things are going and you sort of manage your case if it's a lawsuit that way, I think of the I'm thinking of litigation. And then along comes somebody and says, doesn't really work that way. You know, people, judges kind of just sit down and they look at what the equities are, what seems right. You know, and so that's, and, and, and then they dress it up. So they decide the case, they say this is the equity, this is how it should be decided. And then as we know, other than Judge Posner, most of the appellate court judges, the 200 or so across the country, don't write the first draft. So they turn it over to their clerks, who as Judge Posner says, after they give the judge the draft, they edit it, and as he said, some very lightly, I, they write most of it. So they, these clerks dress up the opinion with citations to statutes, the Constitution, to case law, et cetera. You see, it's like to me a very radical notion. It's talked about in his book, but I guess it's been talked about for what, decades now? Legal realism? Mm -hmm. And is, is there a battle going on? Or do people think, you know, which, which is it? Or is it just ignored? A long question, sorry, but that's... I, I wouldn't say there's a battle going on. I think that, that my description of, of what I think is reality is that in 95, 99% of all litigation, um, there's a need to figure out the facts. That's always highly disputed. But for the most part, judges apply the law in a reasonably objective manner. There are reasonable answers that are pretty clear, and uh, there's not much discretion that judges actually exercise. In a small percentage of cases, which make up a large percentage of the docket of the Supreme Court of the United States, the law is completely unclear. And there is no mechanical right answer or wrong answer. Um, because as you go up the chain of the judiciary, the cases that go further and further up are the ones about which there's more uncertainty. And so if you look at the docket of the Supreme Court, it's probably true that a substantial percentage, almost 100% of their cases, cannot be decided in a mechanical manner. There is not a right or wrong answer in those cases. They wouldn't be at the Supreme Court if there was. But in the vast majority of cases that exist in, in the court system, apart from the facts, which are uncertain, the law is generally pretty clear. But do they turn to precedent and do what we were taught they do, judges? Or do they do what Posner says, is they just decide what they think seems fair? What I'm saying is I think it depends on how clear the law is. And that in, okay. in the vast majority... Oh, okay, in the vast majority of those cases outside the Supreme Court... The law is pretty clear. The law is pretty law. clear, and so they don't decide what sounds right. They just... Right. And but it's within they... the cases where it's unclear, the question is, what do you then do? Okay. And, and now we're talking for a district court judge or an appellate judge or as Supreme opposed court to... Judges. And the, but putting the Supreme Court aside, right. what happens in those cases? Because there's so many, you know more of those cases as opposed to what reaches the Supreme right. Court. So unclear basically means that if you look at the text of the statute or if you look at the prior decisions, there aren't obvious right or wrong answers. This is an issue that hasn't been resolved by the prior decisions or by the text of the statute. And then the question is, well, what does a judge do? 
And in that situation, it's not black and white. And judges will look at a variety of different things in trying to figure it out. They'll obviously look at precedents, but we're assuming a situation here now where the precedent doesn't resolve the question, right? So there they have to look at logic and they have to look at canons of approaches, ways they're supposed to deal with uncertainty. Um, and obviously the more uncertainty there is and the more the individual judge cares about the outcome because he thinks that the issues have strong rights and wrongs, the more the judge is likely to be affected by his own perception. Inject his in, what Posner calls his priors, right? Yes. His personality, his right. bias, his religion, his political views, all of that gets smushed together and out comes, he's got a lot of discretion on that because the law isn't clear, is what you're saying. Yeah, so the, one of the reasons we have multi-member courts is to try to on minimize the, the risk level, of that. Right. Three, but right. on the district courts, you only have one. Right, so, but yeah. they're, they're appealable to higher okay. courts with more judges. So the, the way the court system is set up is to try to minimize the extent to which an individual judge's idiosyncratic views can dictate the law. Now, they may decide a particular case. Does it work? It works as well as anybody else does. Better than any other system? I would say so. Because, you know, Posner seems to think the American judiciary is gloried too much. We think it works so well, and it really doesn't. I think I'm paraphrasing, but, and he says it's always looking backward. He hates things looking backward. He says, you know, you shepherdize, you look at precedent. He said, you look at the U.S. Constitution. He says, that's an old document. This was astounding to me, but he said, if he didn't say it when I interviewed him, he said elsewhere, that's an old document. No, that can't tell you about what you do, Fourth Amendment, you know search and seizure so well. I said, wouldn't you look at the Fourth Amendment? Well, you might, but he says it's empty. He says the Fourth Amendment is devoid because it says essentially your, seizure, your search and seizure must be reasonable. And he says, what's that? Do you agree with Judge Posner? I think that overstates um, that position. Uh, one of the ways in which you try to minimize the individual discretion of judges is by looking to things that constrain them. And you can't have it both ways. You can't really say that there's nothing there, precedents and text and so on, that constrains you, and then accuse judges of not being principled. Because then what are they going to be principled about, except their own views? So I, I think that it's, it's, it would not be a good legal system in which judges, in fact, did not look to precedent and text and, and so Even on. Even the court. Okay. So let's get to the Supreme Court. What do we have right now? We've got eight justices. Correct. Anthony Kennedy, Clarence Thomas, Sam Alito, John Roberts. That would be the block of four conservatives. I'd say three conservatives and one moderate conservative. Kennedy is like the swing. So when Scalia was there before he passed away, it was the Kennedy court because you had four conservatives with Scalia and you had four Democrats who were viewed as four liberals, Ginsburg, Breyer, Sotomayor, and Kagan. And then what Kennedy said decided. So it wasn't the Roberts court, it was the Kennedy court, am I right? It depended on the issue, but on, on, yeah. the, most, on the most controversial and public issues, um, abortion, affirmative action, uh, gay rights, uh, Kennedy was a swing vote, yes. Okay. So now, along, uh, Scalia passes away. When was that, in February or so yes, of this year? February. February. So this document says the president has the power to nominate subject to the advice and consent of the Senate, right? Doesn't say when, so you know politics is always involved. And so the Republicans say, oh, we don't want Barack Obama making this appointment. So we have the power, we have the control of the Senate, the Republicans do. And they say, hey, I think we should, it's fair, we want to be fair, fair to wait to see who the people choose as their president, and that person will decide. You can't really fight with that, can you? Can't fight with it? Yeah, isn't that reasonable? I mean, is there anything in the Constitution that says that this Senate Judiciary Committee has to hold hearings and has to decide this in the last 10 months of Barack Obama's term? Is it? Is it in the Constitution? I, I guess I, I would say that it is unconscionable and, and completely incompatible with 200 years of tradition that they behave the way they do. Is it unconstitutional? Not everything's governed by the Constitution. If I had to, if I had to ask, answer the question, I would say probably yes for the following reasons. When the framers adopted that provision of the Constitution, 
they were trying to figure out how best to select judges and justices of the Supreme Court. And on the one hand, they were very skeptical about the executive branch. They were distrustful of the executive, which is why they have all these checks and balances in the government. Um, and so what they basically decided is that we'll, we'll let the president nominate and the Senate will have the power to advise and consent. But their assumption, clearly, was that the, the Senate would give their consent unless the president made a nomination that was unqualified. No, but you know, Barack Obama himself said, you must remember this, when he was a U.S. senator, he said, you can be a perfectly nice, fine person, but if your heart, I think, I'm paraphrasing, if your heart isn't in the right place, it's okay for a U.S. senator to vote against you. No, he did not say that. What did he say? He didn't say qualified, I don't think. I think he certainly talked about empathy, didn't he? That he was talking about that in terms of who he would appoint. That's different. Oh, no, I thought this was when he was voting no, because no. he opposed some people in the Senate. He opposed he? Alito. Yes. Right. And you're saying he thought Alito was unqualified? Let me define what I mean by unqualified. Okay. Okay. I think unqualified in this context means basically either you don't have the credentials, the experience, to give confidence that you're capable of doing the job well. That was not a problem with Alito. Second is ethical issues. Um, you may be intellectually qualified, but may lack the ethical standards. And the third is whether your views are within a reasonable mainstream of legal thought. Okay, so intellectual, ethical, mainstream. Right. Now, you, could not, you can confirm people who are not in the mainstream, but it's legitimate to say if you have a Senate okay. says, look, we, we don't think this person who is, in our view, like a Robert Bork, uh, should be not, should be confirmed, even though he was clearly intellectually talented, even though he was um, ethical, because we think his views are sort of off the charts, and being out of the mainstream. Yes, and in Alito's case, I think the number of you think he was you. You didn't have to ask what I thought. You asked him what. So you think Obama voted against him because he thought Alito was out of the mainstream? Yes. Do you agree with Obama on that assessment? Probably not. Okay. Although I opposed Alito too. For what um, reason then? Because well, because I, I thought that Alito's views were um, too ideological and not sufficiently judicial. Well, so where we does that fall in the ethical? We go more to qualified. What? We go more to qualified disposition. Qualified. No, but if his you said it has to be unethical, not intellectual qualified. enough to be qualified. Yeah, I mean, if someone votes too much on ideology. You're, you're not qualified if you vote too much. So that's like a fourth factor you're including. Well, I, I, I would treat that as sort of qualified, but yeah. Okay. Or mainstream. I mean, that mainstream. Be the mainstream point, okay. too, right? So assuming even that we agree that Hillary is likely to win, let's take that as a hypothetical right. given, right? Yeah. You still have two different scenarios depending on who controls the, the Senate, because the Senate has to advise and consent for the, anyone to be confirmed. Um, so under one scenario, if you assume that the Republicans maintain their control of the Senate, right. then the question for them is, are they prepared to confirm Merrick Garland, um, or will they continue the obstructionism that they have exercised thus far, um, simply because they have the power to do it? And I don't know the answer to that. I mean, I think I would never have guessed, I would never have guessed that they would behave the way they have over the last six months. And by, it's unprecedented in American history. It's completely unconscionable. I, I would not have thought even the Republicans would have done this. And, and by, um, by continuing to be obstructionist, you would mean over four years hold out for the kind of judge, judge, justices they would like on the Supreme Court. And if, and if Hillary doesn't nominate somebody like that, they'll simply either not hold hearings or hold hearings and then vote them down. They've et gotten away with what they've done so far, and knowing that they could get away with it, uh, who knows? I mean, they might just decide to adhere to this position and said, we're going to pick the justice, not you. If you don't agree with our person, we're not going to confirm. So right now, there are like four or five, and there probably are a dozen names that people throw out as likely appointees. And, and they tell us something about the kinds of people who people in general, without getting, well, I'll use specifics to illustrate this, but Sri, what's his last name? Sri Nivasan. 49 years old, Stanford undergrad, MBA, Stanford, Stanford law degree, born in India, immigrated here at four, grew up in Kansas City, approved when he was nominated. He's now on the D.C. circuit for the last three years. And when he, his confirmation came up, he was approved unanimously, 98 mm -hmm. to nothing, 18-0. We can go through the others, but that is, 
he is like your ideal person. And I guess his views would be traditionally liberal. Uh, it's simplifying case came before him where he approved Obama's clean energy plan regulations. You could challenge whether it had followed the correct procedures and so forth. I don't mean he approved the specific plan. He approved sort of if things, laws that, programs that had the effect of applying minimum wages to and overtime rules to home care in a way that liberals would generally like. So generally, I think somebody who's acceptable, more than acceptable to traditional liberals. Right? He's a moderate liberal. Moderate liberal. Okay. The others, I'll just tick them off. They differ. Well, Merrick Garland is still in there, but he's older. He's 63. He's 64. And Jane Kelly's 51. Doesn't quite have the background of Sri Judge Brown, who's mentioned, but is district court judge, not quite the background of Sri. Um, judge Paul Wolford. So, at least for your first appointment, if you're doing this, you're probably going with Sri, if you were the president. Um, well, I don't. I, I mean, I know you know these people, so I'm not trying to say like you favor them. I'm just saying if you were looking at it as I've rambled off the or ticked off the sort of objective things. And I don't mean you necessarily, um, you Professor Stone, but the people advise, advising Hillary, let me put yourself in their shoes. They got this data, they got this, and they say, boy, our first person out of here, we'll just go with Sri. All the names you mentioned are, are solid, reasonable You'd be okay nominees. with all of them. And you think most of the people around him would probably be okay with, except for Merrick because he's older. Well, there are also people on, on, on the left who would like to see someone more liberal than Sri. Than Sri's yeah. Shree's might be too, too yeah. moderate. Yeah, I think all of them are basically pretty moderate liberals. There has not been a real liberal justice on the Supreme Court uh, since Thurgood Marshall. So if Hillary wins, if the Republicans maintain the majority, she probably doesn't want that fight. That's not going to happen. But if the Democrats take control, she can say, Sri, we'll wait for a while. I'm going with a, a more liberal person. Right. And she would please that right. crowd. There's no one on the current Supreme Court who is like um, a William Brennan or a Thurgood Marshall or a, an Arthur Goldberg or an Abe Fortas or an Earl Warren. Because those folks couldn't get by, even, even if the Republicans didn't have the majority, somebody like those folks ha wouldn't have been nominated by Clinton because he couldn't get it through the Senate? Yeah. Exactly. That's, is that basically yeah, it? Yeah, exactly. Or he would have, because he probably, his own views probably are closer to that. Probably right. Now, okay. That doesn't mean there should be six of those, but the fact is that you know, we've had on the court in recent years Scalia, Thomas, Roberts, Alito, Rehnquist. Those are five judges who are, by any measure, very conservative. There's not been a very liberal or even really liberal judge. Well, Ruth Bader Ginsburg, some would say, Ginsburg's is pretty actually very, Ginsburg's actually very cautious. Really? Yeah, as a justice. And... And Breyer, too? Oh, yeah. And Kagan okay. as well. And so do we are so far has been. Right. Okay. So on the Republican side, they mentioned some names. Steve Culleton, appointed by Bush to the Eighth Circuit 13 years ago. Princeton undergrad, Yale Law School, Judge Silverman, conservative, but a, certainly a well-thought-of judge that he clerked for, then clerked for Rehnquist on the Supreme Court, then worked for Starr, but it, sort of in the mild terms, in the independent counsel years, first year, before I think they got to impeachment. Somebody has said he's a walking encyclopedia of the law, especially Supreme Court. He's sort of like, not exactly, but he's sort of the Republican version of Shri. If Trump were there and he wanted to go with somebody who's pretty solid, call it be his guy. We could go through Raymond Grunder. We could go through Bill Pryor. We could go through uh, Diane Sykes. Yeah, some of but those are those much have more some of those are much, much more, more controversial, and much more convincing, yeah. and may not have the background that I've mentioned, the qualifications. So I'm saying there's some similarity here. Obviously, their views are quite different. But whoever is doing this to give people an idea, have we given people an idea, whether it's Trump there, whether it's Hillary, this is kind of the process. They know, have we gotten to the core, or did I really screw it up? Here? For almost half a century now, since Richard Nixon was elected, we have had a majority conservative Supreme Court. That is, at every single moment since basically 1969, we've had at least five, and often more than five, Republican and conservative justices. Um, this is the first time uh, since then when there's a possibility of having uh, five democratically appointed justices, and for the first time, a more liberal court. And it's easy to understand why the Republicans 
are so unnerved by the prospect, even of a Merrick Garland, who is a moderate liberal, um, because it does pose a real possibility of shift in some of the court's positions on areas like guns, on areas like Citizens United, um, on gay rights, uh, on abortion, on affirmative action. Those are all issues where a majority liberal court will be quite different from a majority conservative court. And so it is true that the stakes are pretty high in this next confirmation. But, but with Trump, honestly, I mean, I think he's demonstrated himself to be such a reckless, irresponsible, incompetent person that I honestly don't believe, even though I think the stakes are high on the Supreme Court, I honestly don't believe that those stakes are high enough to justify putting Donald Trump in the White House. He's not a John McCain or a Mitt Romney. Uh, he is a dangerous character. And across do a whole range he, of Do you think he's listed? Do you have respect for conservatives? Put aside of Trump. Of course. So when I, I, I said liberal and you said what you say, if I said to conservative to you, what comes to mind? Um, I, I would say um, more concerned with certain things that I think they should be less concerned with. Uh, it depends on which kind of conservative. One of the problems is there are many different types of conservatives. So some of it is, con is, is concerned with the wealth of the wealthy and preserving it. Let's say like a some Marco Rubio, you know Marco Rubio, pretty solid conservative, says a lot of uh, things about the Constitution, less smart. government, less taxes, he's, less, you know, those traditional conservative things. I would say Marco Rubio. Smart. Would you put him in a category that's an okay conservative? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And that doesn't mean he'd be my preference. Paul Ryan, an okay same. conservative? Yeah. Same, same. But you're saying there's some others. Well, Trump. Yeah. I don't well, know but, what others. See, Trump's I don't know in Trump, the was a, by himself. Trump was not a conservative most of his life. He's new to this if he is. As you know, he was pro life, pro gun control, big supporter of Hillary, Democrats, Republicans. He had no philosophy. He was in New York, so he probably leaned left. He was generating, he was doing what he had to do to. Build up his I don't business. care whether Trump is a Republican or a Democrat or a liberal or conservative. I do not trust my country with him. Okay. And if he were the Democratic nominee, I guarantee you, I'd be voting for Paul Ryan. If he were the Democratic nominee, because you would trust your country so much more with Paul Ryan even though than you would, I would even though he's the Supreme Court. Court. I would, right. I would say gotcha. Trump is just off the charts, in my so, view. And so Anthony Kennedy is eighty. Ruth Bader Ginsburg is 83, uh, Breyer is 78. Those are the three people in addition, in addition to the vacancy that's already there that you, one would speculate may step down or may run into health issues and so forth. So a reasonable shot in four to eight years, the person who's president could be appointing four, mm -hmm. which dramatically changes things. Well, it, it doesn't dramatically change things if it's a Democrat because of those of those three you mentioned, two of them are, are, are on the liberal side, and only one is on the conservative side. But um, but yeah, it'll well, change the course. Well, I mean, yeah, but if it were if it were Republican there, then you could ra you could push the court further yeah, to the, the right. Yeah, the court would move much further right. to, the, to the right. Yeah. Yes. So in that sense. Yes. Okay. Well, I can't. I can't. I mean, Kennedy becomes the swing vote. So for the Republicans to move the court, you'd have to replace Scalia and one of the others. So as and I then Kennedy would no longer be the swing vote. When you look around, you mm -hmm. don't just see buildings, you don't just see classrooms, you don't just see the University of Chicago. You were a provost here. Mm -hmm. You were the dean of the law school. Um, you visited NYU for a year. Some people were speculating you might leave this place. Not a chance. Not a chance. You feel this affection for the law school. Oh, yeah. What is it about the university? In your view, is the University of Chicago law school better than Harvard, better than Yale, better than any place? Yes. In absolutely. law school, yeah. The intellectual. And the law. And the law, but just in general? The intellectual culture is extraordinary. And this is a place where faculty are present, they exchange papers, they argue with one another, they have lunch three days a week together as a faculty. Um, in the faculty club, they have a workshop every Thursday, so four days a week they're together, they're arguing, they're changing, exchanging views, learning from each other. It's a remarkable place, absolutely remarkable place. No, nothing else is like it. So if you could, you'd spend another four decades here? Yeah. All right. Thank you so much, Professor Stone. My pleasure. Thank I'd you. love to do it again. I hope. Okay.